That'll be all for the moment, Felix. Oh, Felix. Sir Hugo's guest is due to arrive at 8 o'clock, but it's possible she might be a little late, so I think you should be prepared to serve the dinner at about 8.30. A touch of garlic in the salad dressing as usual, milady? Yes, but only the very smallest touch. We don't want a repetition of last Friday, do we? Last Friday is much to be regretted, milady, but if you will remember, I was not on duty then. Giovanni is a most willing boy, but he is not as yet accustomed to Sir Hugo's taste. Well, you will warn him to be more careful next time, hmm? Very good, my lady. Hello? Oh, is that you, Carl? Yes, this is Hilda Latimer speaking. Yes, you got my message, good. Now, regarding the lecture tour of the States... No, 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 Sir Hugo really isn't up to it. Oh, yes, yes, he is much better. But the doctor insists that he does not undertake anything that is not absolutely necessary. Yes, yes, he will accept the doctorate at the university and prepare a speech as arranged, but nothing more than that. And after that, we shall either come straight back here or we will go to Arizona for a rest. No, 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 he's resting. Otherwise, he was speaking to you at this moment. Now. Regarding the film proposition for The Winding River, you must put in the contract that he has complete veto over script and adapter. Well, he won't sign it unless that is confirmed in writing. On the contrary, I think it matters a great deal. It involves his name and reputation. What involves my name and reputation? It's Carl. We're talking about The Winding River contract. Well, I have no intention of signing it, whatever concessions they make. But Hugo, dear, you did say that if they gave you complete veto... I've changed my mind. I've had no less than three novels and five of my best short stories massacred by that cretinous medium. I refuse to have any more of it. Uh, I can't speak to you any more at the moment, Carl. Uh, will you ring me back tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock and uh, see that it's put straight through to my room? Yes. Goodbye. Carl's getting out of hand. Needs a serious talking to. All he thinks about is his damn percentage. What? You can't altogether blame him for that. He is your agent. What time is it? It's nearly half past seven. Isn't that clock going? I haven't the faintest idea. It's so exquisitely made, I can't see it without my glasses. You said you were delighted with it when I gave it to you. Well, I'm not now. I'm sorry. I tried to change it. Please don't look martyred draws your mouth down at the corners, like a weary old camel. Thank you. With two unsymmetrical humps. That's a drama, Derry. Have you had your bath? No, I have not had my bath. Well, don't you think you should? She's due at eight. Well, if I'm not ready, she can wait for me, can't she? An extra ten minutes tacked on to all those years. Can't matter all that much. Oh, damn that bloody instrument. Why can't you have it switched into your room? Go and sit by it. You're in a very disagreeable mood. Well, I'm nervous. Well, it's your own fault if you are. You need not have agreed to see her. For God's sake, answer it. Oh, oui, oui. À l'appareil. Ah, Mariette, c'est vous. Uh, non, je ne suis pas certain. Uh, si vous voudrez attendre par un petit moment, je vais voir. It's Mariette. You're curiously enough, I gathered that. Why didn't you say I was out? Well, I can still say you're being massaged. But you said that last time. She'll think I spend my whole life being massaged. You'll give it to me. En instant, Mariette. Ma chère Mariette, enfin, je suis absolument ravi d'entendre ta voix. Comment vas-tu? Alas, no. I cannot possibly, no. I already have a rendezvous this evening. No, 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 not that kind at all, no. This is a rendezvous with the past, the very, very far distant past. Uh, n not another word. I've said far too much as it is. <laughs> very well. Luncheon on Tuesday. Yeah. Until Tuesday, à bientôt, chérie. Well, there was no getting out of that. Put her off three times in the last month. I think you are indiscreet. I've been feeling indiscreet all day. Oh, have you indeed? 
Yes. You know, Mariette is a most incorrigible gossip. Do you want the whole of Switzerland to know all about your private affairs? Switzerland must have a pretty shrewd idea of them by now, anyway. I was not speaking financially. No, Hilda, I didn't think you were. Do go and have your bath and dress. I only said I had a rendezvous with the past. It's perfectly true, I have. I still think this is all a great mistake. Yes, I know you do. You're never exactly adept at hiding your feelings. On the contrary, Hugo, that is one of the things I do best. Living with you for 20 years has been excellent training. Why are you so frightened of Carlotta? I'm not in the least frightened of Carlotta. Oh, yes, you are. The very idea of her fills your soul with dread. Come on now, admit it. It's time for your blue pill. <laughs> She wouldn't suddenly reappear in your life like this, unless she wanted something. Perhaps she wants a reunion. <laughs> Money, more like it. <laughs> she hasn't been very successful these last 15 years. You've been following her career? There hasn't been much career to follow lately. Poor Carlotta. Give me your hand. A lump of sugar for a good little dog. I see you're determined to be tiresome. That's unfair of you to say that. You know you've been so much better lately. Dr. Benoit says that your blood pressure is back to normal. You're sleeping well and, and you, you haven't had any pains for the last three weeks. Do you seriously believe that seeing Carlotta again will excite me to the extent of sending up my blood pressure? Why, you've been giving every indication of it. You're sending up my blood pressure, not Carlotta. Give me a cigarette. That will be your seventh today. No, it won't. It'll be my sixth. I only had one after lunch. Well, just be careful. That's all I ask of you. She made you unhappy once. I don't want you to give her the chance of making you unhappy again. L listen to me, Hilda. My affair with Carlotta lasted exactly two years. And it ended in a blaze of mutual acrimony. It was centuries ago, and we haven't clapped eyes on each other since. Nor have we corresponded. This sudden decision on her part to see me again has not unnaturally filled me with curiosity. It's just possible that your surmise is right, and she wants to borrow money. If that is so, I shall lend her some. For old time's sake. Or she may simply wish to see me again for sentimental reasons. Time and the difficult years may have mellowed her. Or she may merely want to gloat over my age and infirmity. You are not infirm. After all, you must remember she was very much in love with me. And you with her? Of course. Quite frankly, I suspect you of being jealous. No, Hugo, I am not jealous. I realized many years ago that I had no right to be jealous. Since when has jealousy been so law-abiding? I have no wish to argue with you. You're jealous of all my friends. You hate Mariette. You're barely civil to Cedric Markham and David when they come here. They are barely civil to me. Cedric Markham is a man of brilliant intelligence and exquisite taste. He also happens to be the greatest connoisseur of modern art alive today. And what is David? David is one of the most promising young painters that England has produced in the last 20 years. He also happens to be the son of Lord Tenterton. In that case, he should have better manners. And his paintings, I don't care for at all. I think they are ugly and cruel. As a full-blooded German, you are scarcely in a position to object to cruelty in art or in anything else. It 
is very wrong of you to speak to me like that, Hugo. And most unkind. When you are in a better mood, you will see that this is so, and you will be sorry. You cannot, after all these long years, seriously imagine that I am jealous of your friends or of your heart. If I am jealous at all, I, I am jealous for your well-being. For God's sake, stop looking hurt, Hilda. It infuriates me. If you do not wish me to look hurt, why do you try so hard to hurt me? Oh, Lord, now I suppose you're going to cry. No, Hugo. I'm not going to cry. That, too, is a waste of time and energy. I'm going to put on my hat. Hilda. If you are determined to, to receive your long-lost love in your dressing gown and your hair all rumpled, that is entirely your affair. Hilda, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I upset you. Oh, if nothing new. Don't see how I can face her alone now. You'd better stay, after all. Certainly not. I've arranged to dine with Liesel at the grap door and go to the cinema afterwards. Liesel is a weather-beaten old lesbian. She's also highly intelligent. Is she in love with you? Oh, not in the least. She's living with a Chinese student who paints butterflies on glass. What ever for? Actually, she's very talented. Put Liesel off. Don't go. Stay here with me. I need your support. Can't. She's booked the tickets and reserved the table. Well, cut the film then and come straight back here after dinner. No, Hugo. You've brought the situation on yourself. You have to deal with it yourself. Have you ordered the dinner? Yes. Felix will bring it when you ring. I think I'd like a drink to fortify me. I'll ring for some ice. It better be vodka. You're having it with a caviar anyway. I didn't tell you to order caviar. No. It was my own idea. I ordered pink champagne, too. Pink champagne? Good God, why? Well, you're always accusing me of having no sense of humor. I thought I'd like to prove you wrong. Is the rest of the menu equally plutocratic? No, comparatively simple. Steak bernets, green salad, and creme boulet. Chance sleep a wink. Oh, I wouldn't count on that too much, anyhow. Your Maylox tablets are in the table drawer. Ah, Felix, give Sir Hugo a vodka on the rocks, will you? Very good, my lady. I shan't be more than a few minutes. I missed you last evening, Felix. Where did you disappear to? It was my half day off, sir. Your substitute lacked charm. He also breathed like an old locomotive. That was Giovanni, sir. He comes from Calabria. The railway journey must have made a profound impression on him. Your vodka, sir. Thank you. Did you enjoy your half day off? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, we went to swim in the machine at Veve. It's not so crowded as the one here. And then when we came back, we went to see a film. We? Oui. Uh, my friend and I. He is the assistant barman at the Hotel de la Paix. He is a champion swimmer and has won many trophies. You look as though you should be a good swimmer yourself with those shoulders. Not as good as he is, though. Uh, but I myself love to water ski. It's a great sport. Yes, it must be. Water skiing was not invented when I was your age. Thank you, Felix. Uh, you'll bring the dinner when I ring. Uh, very good, monsieur. It should be in about half an hour's time, depending on when my guest arrives. Bien, monsieur. I am Hilda Latimer. How do you do? How do you do? I recognize your voice. You were so kind on the telephone. Oh, Lord. My husband is dressing. Uh -huh. He won't be more than a few moments. Uh -huh. May I? Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, please be so kind as to sit down and take a cigarette if you care to smoke. Boy has done quite well for himself. Oh, what 
a delightful turner and a boudin, too. His skies are always so lovely, aren't they? You are interested in painting? Oh, yes, immensely interested, but I fear not very knowledgeable. <laughs> would you care for a drink? Uh, but no, perhaps not quite yet. I'd, I would rather wait a little. Please. Thank you. How is he, Hugo? Sir Hugo. He is almost completely well again, but of course he has to take care. He has always been uh, nervously overstrung, as you may probably remember. Oh, I don't remember him as being overstrung, exactly. On the contrary, his studied calmness used occasionally to irritate me, but, oh, but it was all so long ago. He has had ample time to change, as indeed we all have. He has certainly had a wonderful career. It wouldn't be surprising if sometimes the burden of his eminence became a trifle nerve-wracking. How fortunate he is to have you to protect him. He is in not quite such urgent need of protection as you may imagine. You've been married for 20 years, haven't you? Yes. He engaged me as his secretary in January 1945, and a few months later we were married. You know, you're not in the least like I expected. Oh, indeed. What did you expect? Someone more grim, less vulnerable. A dragon guarding the throne. You put things so picturesquely, Miss Gray. Perhaps you should have been a writer yourself. Mm -hmm. What is your reaction to this, uh, this rather curious situation? Oh, I have no feelings about it one way or the other. I will accept the snub, although I am not entirely convinced by oh, it. It was not intended as a snub. You will please forgive me. Hugo! Oh, what a strange moment this is, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I had so many things planned to say, and they've gone clean out of my head. Do we embrace? Why not? <laughs> Well, you look slim as ever and so distinguished. The years seem to have forgotten you, Carlotta. Oh, no, my dear. I have remembered them and taken the right precautions. <laughs> you and Hilda have already become friends, I see. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have. You know, it's been puzzling me where I could have seen you before, and now I remember. There is a photograph of you in Hugo's autobiography. You are leaning against a sort of pillar and shading your eyes with your hand as though you were worried about the weather. The sort of pillar was one of the columns of the Parthenon. The light was very strong. Alas, there is no photograph of me in the book, at least only a verbal one. The light was a little strong in that, too. May I offer you a drink? Oh, by all means, I should love one. Whiskey, brandy, gin? Vodka? Um, a, a vodka, please, on the rocks. I had expected you to look much older. Oh, but then people hardly ever look their real age anymore, do they? Your vodka, Miss Gray. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm afraid I must leave you now. I, I have a dinner engagement. Oh. Oh, but how disappointing. I'd hoped to get to know you better. Oh, we shall probably meet again. Of course. We're almost bound to. I have moved into this hotel. Oh. Oh, well, don't be alarmed. I shall only be here for a few days. I am having a series of injections at the clinic, and it is more convenient to be here than in Vevey. Au revoir, then, Miss Gray. A bientôt, Lady Latimer. How lovely it is, isn't it? With the lights glittering in the distance. I went over to Avion the other evening on the little steamer and won nearly a thousand francs. Can you afford to play so high? Oh, yes. I have a certain amount put by. I also still get alimony from my last husband. Have you had many others? Two before this one. They both died. One in an air crash and the other in the war. Did you love them? Oh, yes. I shouldn't have married them if I hadn't. Have you any children? 
Yes, I have a son by my second husband. He's 24 now and very attractive. You'd love him. He's an entomologist. I don't believe I've ever met an entomologist. It's insects, isn't it? Yes. Oh, there's a great deal more in insects than meets the eye. Yes, I'm sure there is. Personally, I've never felt particularly drawn to them. Am I to drink alone? Too much alcohol is bad for me. Oh, too much alcohol is bad for everyone. Oh, just pour yourself a teeny weeny one to keep me company. <laughs> really, Carlotta. You're too absurd. She's nice. Your wife. I like her. I'm so glad. In spite of the fact that she doesn't care much for me. You know, I don't think you quite did her justice in your book. And you weren't very kind about anybody in your book, were you? You were under no obligation to read it. Well, there was no warning on the cover. You take a fairly jaundiced view of your fellow creatures, don't you? Perhaps. I prefer to see people as they are rather than as more sentimental minds would wish them to be. You always told me I was vulgar, according to your lights, that is. But then your lights are so bright and highly placed that they bring out the bags under my eyes and the gutter snipe in my character. They always did and they always will. There's really nothing I can do about it, except perhaps to go away. Would you like me to go away now, this very minute? Of course, I don't want you to go away. <laughs> With all my faults, I'm seldom discourteous. I would wish it to be something warmer than just your courtesy that wishes me to stay. I fear I can offer you little more at the moment, Carlotta, except perhaps curiosity, which is even less complimentary. I'm what is called set in my ways. Well, that implies resignation. Resignation has much to recommend it. Dignity, for one thing. A quality, alas, which is fast disappearing from our world. I think I know what you're up to. I'm open to any suggestions. The witty, cynical author of so many bestsellers is making way for the grand old man of letters. But aren't you jumping the gun a little? No, Carlotta, I am not jumping the gun, nor grasping time by the forelock, nor rushing my fences. Well, you must be prepared for a few clichés if you invite retired actresses to dinner. I am merely accepting without undue dismay the fact of my own mortality. I'm an old man and I at least have the sense to realise it. Don't be waspish, my dear. Just as we were getting along so nicely, at least you can congratulate yourself on having had a fabulously successful career. No wonder you got a knighthood. I begin to suspect that you are here as an enemy. I hoped for a friend. Did you, Hugo? Did you really? Perhaps I was wrong. No, you were not wrong. I think I am more friend than foe, but I suppose there's still a little bitterness left. After all, we were lovers once, for two whole years, actually. Our parting was not very happy, was it? Fairly inevitable, at any rate. I really was very much in love with you. And I with you. How convincingly you say that. Why were you so unkind about me in your memoirs? Ah, ha. Now I'm beginning to understand. <laughs> no, you're not. You're merely jumping to conclusions. My autobiography was an assessment of the events and experiences of my life up to the time of writing it. I endeavoured to be as objective and as truthful as possible. If, in the process, I happened to hurt your feelings, I apologise. Oh, your book may have been an assessment of the outward experiences of your life, but I cannot feel you are entirely honest about your inner ones. Why should I be my inner feelings my own affair? In that case, the book was sailing under false colours. And all this because I described you as a mediocre actress. <laughs> Did you really say that? I'd forgotten. How catty of you. Well, I've already said I was sorry. No, my dear, you apologised. It isn't quite the same thing. Very well. I'm sorry, then. There, will that do? That will do. For the moment. Now. Are you writing anything now? 
Yes, a novel. Unfortunately, I've been a little ill lately, which has halted progress for a time, but now I'm back again to more or less my normal routine. Mm, your self-discipline was always remarkable. It was less constant when we knew each other. There were too many distractions. Did you think I was a mediocre actress then? How could I? I was in love with you. It was later when you laid aside your rose-colored glasses that you began to see through me. It wasn't exactly that I saw through you. It was that I realized that in spite of your vitality and charm and outward allure, there was some essential quality missing. You mean you guessed I would never really become a star? I sensed it rather than guessed it. In any case, your diagnosis was accurate. I never did become a star, not a real star. Oh, but my career has not been altogether a failure, you know. I've played interesting plays, traveled the wide world. My life has fascinated and amused me all along the line. I am seldom bored, and I have few regrets. But the one abiding one is that you would rather have been great than merely competent? You don't happen to have any parchment lying about, do you? Parchment? Yes. When expert zoologists extract the venom from snakes, they force them to bite on parchment. I accept your rebuke. How generous of you. It's curious that you should still be able to arouse such hostility in me. Oh, not really. As a matter of fact, it was always there, just below the surface. When two young people are passionately in love, a certain amount of bickering is inevitable. It even has charm, up to a point. But when the old indulge in it, it's merely tiresome. Oh, speak for yourself. You're the one who's decided to be old. I haven't yet. Perhaps I never shall. You see no point in dignified withdrawal, in growing old gracefully? Oh, there is little grace in growing old, Hugo. I really like slapping on the makeup, having my body massaged and my hair tinted. You have no idea how I enjoy my long, complicated mornings. Oh, I admit that I am liable to fall apart a bit by the late afternoon, but a short snooze fixes that, and then I have all the fun of getting ready again for the evening. And does the evening really justify so much effort? As a general rule, yes. I have many friends, some of them quite young. They seem to enjoy my company. I like to watch them dancing. Why are you so suddenly curious about what has happened to me during all these long years, Carlotta? What is it that you want of me? At the moment, dinner. Carlotta. Well, I only had a salad for lunch and I'm famished. Very well, but please remember that I tire easily. I've ordered the dinner anyhow. I even remember that you like caviar. Oh, that was sweet of you. <laughs> The first time I ever tasted it was with you. You took me to Ciro's for supper after the show. Was I still wooing you then? Or had I won? <laughs> you had already won, more or less, but I think the caviar clinched it. I can remember what we had after the caviar, too. What was it? A filet mignon with sauce bernaise, a green salad, and then, then a creme brulee. And did we by any chance have pink champagne as well? Yes, I believe we did. You will see with what nostalgic charm history can repeat itself. Oh, Hugo, I don't believe you're really old at all. Uh, good evening, Mother. Good evening. Mother. Thank you. Yeah, you can leave the vodka and we'll serve ourselves. Yeah, let's see. How handsome he is. Greek or Italian? A half Italian and half Austrian, I believe. He has a slight look of my first husband, Peter. Poor Peter. His feet trod the world lightly, and alas, all too briefly. Uh, was he the one who was killed in an airplane? Yes. 
He was studying to be a pilot in San Diego. I was trying out a new play in San Francisco. They had the sense not to tell me until after the matinee. How dreadful for you. Yes, it was my first real sorrow. And then a little while afterwards, I had a miscarriage. That was my second real sorrow. Oh, San Francisco is a divine city and I love it, but I always seem to have bad luck when I play there. In 1957, I lost my last remaining tooth in the Curran Theatre. Carlotta. Oh, it was a gallant old stump that held my lower plate together. I remember saying to my understudy one day, Sally, when this is out, you're on. And sure enough, a week later, it was and she was. Look, I don't wish to sound fussy, but I really don't care to discuss false teeth during dinner. Oh, why ever not? That's when they're a force to be reckoned with. Even so, I would welcome a change of subject. Oh, dear Hugo, I am sorry. I remember now you always hated spades being called spades. Well, what shall we talk about? Hmm, perhaps you would like some further vignettes from my rather ramshackle career? Provided they're general rather than clinical. Well, let me see now. Ah, my second husband, Vernon Ritchie, was my leading man in a ghastly play about the Deep South, which ran for ages. Was he a good actor? Oh, no. Terrible. But he made up for his performances on the stage by his performances in the boudoir. He was a sweet man, and I was very fond of him. He was the father of my son, David. He joined the Navy and was killed in the Pacific in 1944. Was that another of your great sorrows? No, just a sadness. Let me help you to some more caviar. Ah, thank you. And uh, your third husband? Dear old Spike. Dear old what? Spike. Spike Frost. Oh, lots of people are called Spike in America. <laughs> oh, he's a movie agent and a very successful one, too. He handles a lot of the big stars. It sounds vaguely pornographic. Oh, hooray. A little joke at last. Almost a little off-color joke, too. <laughs> Things are looking up. Tell me about Hilda. I really see no reason to discuss Hilda with you. I heard you have asked me questions about my husband's and I didn't snap your head off. I liked her. She has wisdom and repose and her eyes are kind. A little sad, perhaps, but kind. I suspect tragedy in her life. Well, you're right. She managed to escape from Nazi Germany in 1940. She left behind the love of her life, a young poet called Gerhard Hendel. He died two years later in a concentration camp. Now, are you satisfied? Well, satisfied is hardly the word I would have chosen, but I'm pleased that you told me. Am I too early, sir? No, we've quite finished. You better open the wine. Bien, monsieur. Oh, Hugo, I do believe it's going to be pink. It is? <laughs> How disarming of you to be so sentimental. Excellent. Do you remember the cottage at Taplow and driving down on summer nights after the show? Yes. Yes, I remember. And the weekend we went to Paris? And I got to the theatre on Monday night exactly seven minutes before curtain time. My understudy was all dressed and ready to go on. You know, I've often wondered why you didn't write any more plays. Your dialogue was so pointed and witty. You flatter me, Carlotta. I have read everything you've ever written. You flatter me even more. Well, I only said I'd read everything you've ever written. I ventured no opinion, flattering or otherwise. The statement alone was flattering enough. Yes. Yes, I expect it was. Oh! I have been in America for too long. 
How lovely to see a steak that doesn't look like a bedroom slipper. Tu vas bien, monsieur? Oui, excellent. Merci, Félix. À votre service, monsieur. He really is most attractive, isn't he? Those glorious shoulders. I hadn't noticed them. They're probably padded, anyhow. Life can be dreadfully treacherous. You really are extraordinary, Carlotti. <laughs> you don't look a day over 50. Well, I should hope not. After three cellular injections and two facelifts. Carlotta. Oh, it's wonderful how they do it now. You can hardly see the scars at all. What on earth possessed you to tell me that? Oh, dear, now I've shocked you again. Aesthetically, yes, you have. Oh, I am so sorry, just as we were making such progress. I mean, since the object of such operations is presumably to create an illusion, why destroy the illusion by telling everybody about it? You're quite right, Hugo. As a matter of fact, you could do with a little snip yourself, right under the chin. I wouldn't dream of it. Why have you come here, Carlotta? I told you I'm taking a course of injections at Professor Borromelli's clinic. Professor Borromelli? Mm. And do you know him? The general consensus of opinion is that he's a quack. Oh, quack or no quack, he's an old duck. Don't be foolish, Carlotta. Oh, there's no need to stamp on my little joke as though it were a cockroach. Well, I'm still waiting to hear the reason for this, shall we say, rather tardy reappearance in my life. Prepare yourself for a tiny shock. I'm quite prepared. Go on. I, too, have written an autobiography. Have you? How interesting. There is a distinct chill in your voice. I'm sorry, I was unaware of it. It is to be published in the autumn. Congratulations. By whom? Doubleday in New York and Heinemann in London. Excellent. I'm so glad you approve. And have you written it all yourself? Have you employed what I believe is described as a ghost writer? No, Hugo. I have written every word of it myself. Well done. And you want me to write an introductory preface? No, I've already done that, too. Well, what is it, then? What is it that you want of me? Permission to publish your letters. Letters? What letters? The letters you wrote to me when we were lovers. I've kept them all. Any letters I wrote at that time were private. They concerned nobody but you and me. I agree. But that was a long time ago, before either of us had become celebrated enough to write our memoirs. I cannot think that you, Carlotta, have even yet achieved that particular distinction. Doubleday and Heinemann do. I believe that some years ago, <clears throat> Mrs. Patrick Campbell made a similar request to Mr. George Bernard Shaw. And his reply was, certainly not, I have no intention of playing the horse to your Lady Godiva. How unkind. It would ill become me to try to improve on Mr. George Bernard Shaw. You mean you refuse? Certainly. I most emphatically refuse. Yes, I thought you would. Completely horrified by your suggestion. It's in the worst possible taste. Oh, well, never mind. Let's have some more champagne. Not for me. Oh, well, there's quite a lot left. Well, finish it by all means. <gasps> Professor Borromelli will be furious. I gather he doesn't insist on any particular regime. Um, what sort of injections does he give you? Oh, it's a formula of his own, hormones and things. The same sort of treatment as uh, knee hearts. Hmm. Oh, no, quite different. Have you been to him as well? Oh, yes, ages ago. He's an old duck, too. You seem to regard Switzerland as a sort of barnyard. <laughs> quack, quack. Don't be childish. Oh, perfect timing, Felix. I congratulate you. Thank you, madam. <clears throat> oh, the lake is like glass. There'll be a moon presently. How clever of you to know. Well, there was a moon last night, so I just put two and two together. 
So Hugo tells me you're half Austrian and half Italian, Felix. That is correct, madame. And which half do you like best? Please come. I find the two perfectly satisfactory, madame. I suppose both the waltz and the tarantella come quite naturally to you. That will be all for the moment, Felix. Bring the coffee immediately. Subito, signore. <gasps> Creme brulee. I hate familiarity with servants. Oh, eat up your pudding for God's sake and stop being so disagreeable. How dare you speak to me like that? Dare? Really, Hugo, what have I to fear from you? I consider your rudeness insufferable. And I consider your pomposity insufferable. I should like to remind you that you are my guest. Well, of course I am. Don't be so silly. Once and for all, come Oh, up. for heaven's sake, calm down. Your wife told me earlier that it was bad for you to get overexcited. Now, you'll have a fit in a minute if you don't stop gibbering. I am not gibbering. I think, Carlotta, that as we really haven't very much more to say to each other, it would be considerate of you to leave as soon as you've finished eating. I'm sorry if I appear discourteous, but it was, after all, you who forced us into this rather unprofitable meeting. I'm sorry also that I'm unable to accede to your request, but I'm sure that when you've given yourself time to think it over, you will realize how impertinent it was. Why impertinent? Not having read your book, I have naturally no way of judging whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. I am perfectly aware, however, that the inclusion of private letters from a man in my position would enhance its value considerably. Am I to be allowed a cup of coffee before I leave? Of course, you'll bring it in a moment. Poor Hugo. I'm in no need of your commiseration. Oh, well, think carefully, and you may not be quite so sure. Any man who can refuse a request as gracelessly and contemptuously as you have done is neither happy nor secure. Coffee, monsieur. For madame only. You can put it in there and take away the dinner table. Very good, monsieur. You are afraid of not sleeping? I never drink coffee in the evenings. Well, what about a nice cup of cocoa? Inelegant, but soothing. Will that be all, monsieur? Yes, thank you. Good night, monsieur. Madame. Oh, good night, Felix. The dinner was delicious and the service impeccable. Madame is most kind. À votre service, monsieur. You take sugar? Yes, please. A little. Well, how long have I got before the curfew sounds? There's your coffee. The letters really are very good, Hugo. It's disappointing you won't allow me to use them. They are love letters, brilliantly written. The more ardent passages are exquisitely phrased, although they do give the impression of having been commissioned by your head rather than dictated by your heart. I really have no wish to discuss the matter any further. Well, it seems a pity that posterity should be deprived of such an illuminating example of your earlier work. I'm really very tired, Carlotta. Feel that my age entitles me to ask you to leave me alone now. Perhaps we may meet and talk again within the next few days. My wrap is in the bedroom. Hilda put it there. May I fetch it? By all means. Good night, Hugo. I'm sorry our evening has ended so, so uncozily. So am I, Carlotta. So am I. To revert to the unfortunate subject of the letters for a moment, you may have them if you like. They are, are of no further use to me. That's really most generous of you. I'm afraid I can't let you have the others, though. That would be betraying a sacred promise. Others? What others? Your letters to Perry. My letters to Perry? What do you mean? 
Perry Sheldon. I happened to be with him when he died. What do you know about Perry Sheldon? Among other things, that he was the only true love of your life. Good night, Hugo. Sleep well. I must talk to you. Please, Carlotta. You know perfectly well that it can't wait until tomorrow. Please come. Yes, now. Immediately. The champagne, monsieur. Thank you, Felix. You may put it on the table. Would you wish me to open it, miss? Oh, yes, please do, Felix. I'm sure neither Sir Hugo nor I could manage it as efficiently as you. Sit down, madame. Monsieur. Put it down, please. I'll drink it later. Will that be all, monsieur? Yes, that will be all. Good night, Felix. I have put a bottle of Evian in your room as requested, madame. Oh, thank you, Felix. Good night. Good night, madame. Well. At least it's pleasant to have one request granted, even if it's only a bottle of Avion. I am finding the flippancy of your manner extremely trying. Well, you always did. In any case, this is not a tragic situation, Hugo. There is only comedy left now, rather bitter comedy, I admit, but not entirely unenjoyable. You must forgive my lack of humor. True humor lies in the capacity to laugh at oneself. That you could never do. I fear it's a little too late for me to change. You said you were with Perry Sheldon when he died. Is that true? Yes. And you have in your possession letters written by me to him? Yes. Love letters, most of them. They are less meticulously lyrical than the ones you wrote to me, but there is more genuine feeling in them. They were written in your earlier years, remember, before your mind had been corrupted by fame and your heart by caution. The last ones were written in the last years of his life. There are three of them, all refusals to help him when he was in desperate straits. They also are fascinating in their way, masterpieces of veiled invective. Pure gold for your future biographer. Did you steal those letters? No, Hugo, I did not steal them. He gave them to me three days before he died. What do you propose to do with them? I haven't quite decided yet. I made him a promise. What sort of promise? I promised him I would keep them safe until the time came when they could be used to the best advantage. Used to the best advantage? Used in what way? By a suitable biographer. Are you intending to be that biographer? Oh, no, I'm not experienced enough. It would require someone more detached and objective than I am. My personal feelings would be involved. Your emotional tenacity is remarkable. There is no longer any emotion in my feelings for you, Hugo. Wouldn't you consider revenge an emotion? Revenge? Oh, now you're jumping to the wrong conclusions again. My motives in all this are altruistic rather than vindictive. Suddenly, in my rattled old age, I have seen the light. I find myself possessed with a desire to right wrongs, to see justice done. I am not impressed. To revert to the subject of my as-yet-unnamed biographer, have you found one? Of course. May I ask his name? Certainly. It is Justin Chandler. 
He was a professor at Harvard, and I first met him when I was playing Hedda Gabler in Boston. I didn't give a damn what you were playing in Boston. I know you don't, but it was Hedda Gabler. And am I to believe that this eminent Harvard professor is contemplating writing a biography of me without even asking my permission? Well, he once wrote a monograph on you for the Atlantic Monthly. It was called Technique and What Next? He is a fervent admirer of your literary craftsmanship. He said that your autobiography was the most superlative example of sustained camouflage he had ever read. He certainly is a smart cookie. My knowledge of American slang is limited. Well, the exact English translation would be clever biscuit. And it's your intention to hand over to this clever biscuit private letters of mine written to somebody else over 30 years ago. But you must realize that they are exceedingly valuable documents. Your fame has made them so. How much do you want? Don't be silly, Hugo. Give me a little more champagne. The knowledge that my letters to Perry Sheldon are still in existence has naturally come as a considerable shock to me. It would be foolish to deny it. I assume you've taken the trouble to acquaint yourself with the legal aspects of the situation. Well, the legal aspects of the situation are fairly simple. Any letter, once it is posted, automatically becomes the property of the recipient. In this case, Perry was the recipient. He made the letters over to me in a written statement that was witnessed by a public notary. They now legally belong to me, and I am at liberty to do what I like with them. I fear you are misinformed. The letters may indeed be your property, but according to law, they may not be published without my permission or when I die, the permission of my estate. Yes, you may be right, but so far there has been no question of them being published. The important fact is that they exist and will remain a potential menace to your carefully sculptured reputation. Where are the letters? I have them with me. You have not yet told me what you propose to do with them. Because I have not yet decided. This is intolerable. Come to the point. The veiled threat is perfectly clear. What veiled threat? The threat to expose to the world that I have had in the past homosexual tendencies. Tendencies in the past? What nonsense. You've been a homosexual all your life, and you know it. That is not true. Now, don't shout. It's a waste of adrenaline. Now, for God's sake, have a little brandy and pull yourself together. Here, I'll get you some. I don't care what you do. You can publish whatever you like and be damned to you. Here, Hugo, drink this and stop being hysterical. Ah! Go away. Leave me alone. Go away and leave me alone. Why do you hate me so? Is it because you once loved me? Well, Hugo, you've got it all wrong. I don't hate you. And loving you, I only dimly remember. When I said you had been homosexual all your life, did you consider that an insult? Wasn't it intended to be? Well, of course not. We're living in the 1960s, not the 1890s. Sophisticated tolerance hardly fits in with the sneer in your voice when you accuse me of it. You're oversensitive. I didn't accuse you of it but for the simple reason that I do not consider it a crime. I am accusing you of something far worse than that. Complacent cruelty and moral cowardice. On what evidence? On the evidence of every book you've ever written and the dismal record of your personal relationships. I'm not interested in your opinion of my character. What I am interested in is the motive that impelled you to come here. Well, I suppose basically it was irritation more than anything else. Irritation? Why? 
Perhaps because I loved you once and had such high hopes for you. Poppycock. It was because I left you behind half a lifetime ago and your greedy female vanity has never forgiven me for oh, it. Now calm down, Hugo, or you'll go off the rails again in a minute. Would you be kind enough to give me a little water? I'm feeling certainly rather ill. Get it yourself. You're as strong as an ox. That was rude of me. I apologize. After all, you are older than I am. How much do you want for those letters? Oh, Hugo, I am sorry for you. That is entirely irrelevant. Please name your price. The letters are not for sale. What did Perry die of? Leukemia. He had had a bad attack of hepatitis the year before. Brought on by drink? Yes, I think so. When did he die? About two years ago. I see. The only vitality he had left was in his eyes. They still retained a glimmer of hope. How do you expect me to react to this, Carla? Exactly as you are reacting. For the moment, you're manufacturing a little retrospective regret, which may indeed be quite genuine, but it isn't enough. You didn't even know he had died. How could I have known? Two years ago, I was in West Africa. I returned to Rome in the spring. We were living in Rome at the time. Yes, it was from Rome you wrote your last three cruel letters to him. I want those letters back, Carlotta. Just those three, or the other ones as well? All of them, of course. You must see how important this is to me. Certainly I do. Was it true what you said just now about this eminent Harvard professor wishing to write about me? Yes, perfectly true. I have no alternative but to throw myself on your mercy, Carlotte. No, you haven't. If you had the choice, would you take the earlier letters back, or the later ones? The earlier ones? Yes, I was afraid you'd say that. You can also, I imagine, understand my reasons. Yes. You would prefer to be regarded as cynical, mean, and unforgiving, rather than as a vulnerable human being capable of tenderness. In these particular circumstances? Yes. Why? You have failed to take into account one important factor of the situation. And what is that? According to the law in England, homosexuality is still a penal offence. Oh, well, in the opinion of all sensible and unprejudiced people, that law has become archaic and is nonsensical. Nevertheless, it exists. It won't exist much longer. Well, even when the actual law ceases to exist, there will still be a stigma attached to the love that dare not speak its name in the minds of millions of people for generations to come. Do you really believe that the sales of your books would diminish if the reading public were to discover you were sexually abnormal? My private inclinations are not the concern of the reading public. I have no urge to martyr my reputation for the sake of self-indulgent exhibitionism. Oh, well, even that would be better than vitiating your considerable talent by dishonesty. Dishonesty? In what way have I been dishonest? Subtly, in all your novels and stories, and certainly in your autobiography. It is a brilliant and entertaining book. Thank you, Carlotta. Thank you very much. But why the constant implications of heterosexual ardor? And above all, why the contemptuous betrayal of Perry Sheldon? I forbid you to say any more. There was no betrayal. He loved you, looked after you and waited on you hand and foot. For years he traveled the wide world with you, and yet in your book you dismiss him in a few lines as an adequate secretary. My relationship with Perry Shelton is none of your bloody business. Once and for all, Carlotta, will you either give me or sell me those letters? No. Not yet. Perhaps never. Has it ever occurred to you 
that you might have been indirectly responsible for Perry's death? If I'd murdered him with my bare hands, it would still have nothing to do with you. You discarded him ruthlessly, without a shred of gratitude or compassion. You wrote him off as a bad debt. He was a bad debt. He was an alcoholic. An alcoholic's bore me. And whose fault was it he became an alcoholic? His own. Do you really think you can shrug off the responsibility as casually as that? You are implying that my tyranny drove him to it. Not your tyranny, your indifference. Rubbish. Perry took to the bottle because he liked it. Because he was a weak and feckless character. And yet you loved him. You loved him for quite a long while. Your letters prove it. I should have thought that even your cheap magazine mentality would have learned by now that it is seldom with people's characters that one falls in love. If for some reason best known to yourself, you feel it your bounden duty to chastise me, to destroy my reputation, to batter me in the dust and lay bare the quivering secrets of my evil soul, I've no means of preventing you, so get on with it. Attack me as much as you like, but for Christ's sake, don't bore me. You certainly are quite a smart cookie. I'm also an old cookie, and it's long past my bedtime. Are you throwing me out again? I most certainly am. The impasse remains. If you have no intention of either selling me or giving me those letters, then why are you here? Is it perhaps a long cherished stale revenge for some imaginary wrong I've done you in the past? No, no, it isn't that. Through your relationship with me, you acquired a leading part and an assured position in the theater. I was 21. And curiously enough, considering I had been involved in the theater since I was 14, I was a virgin. Are you now casting me in the role of the vile seducer? You used me. You used me and betrayed me, just as you've used and betrayed every human being who has ever shown you the slightest sign of true affection. You waved me like a flag to prove a fallacy. A fallacy? What fallacy? That your morals were orderly, that you were, in fact, normal. If you had had the courage to trust me, and let me share your uneasy secret, oh, not in the first year, perhaps. I might perhaps even now have remained your loyal and devoted friend. As it was, you elbowed me out of your life with vulgarity and without grace, Hugo. And even now I can remember the relief in your voice when you said goodbye and packed me off to America. I didn't pack you off to America. You went with an excellent contract and in a first-class stateroom. <sighs> I can see clearly I am wasting my time. You most certainly are, and mine. The only interesting fact that has emerged from your impassioned tirades this evening is that in spite of a full life, three husbands, and an excessive amount of plastic surgery, you have managed to keep this ancient wound so freshly bleeding. You must be suffering from a sort of emotional hemophilia. I salute you. You're an unregenerate old bitch. I do hope I have not come back at an awkward moment. Uh, were you discussing anything of importance? No. Nothing of the smallest importance. We were just reminiscing. Oh, how nice. It's always fun talking over old times, isn't it? Enormous fun. Hugo and I have been in stitches, haven't we, Hugo? I wish you'd take off that hat, Hilda. It makes you look like a cab driver. Oh, certainly, dear. I don't care for too much myself. I see you decided not to go to the cinema after all. Yes, Liesel and I just stayed on gossiping after dinner. You have never met Liesel Kessler? No, I'm afraid I haven't. Oh, she's a very great friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Hugo always laughs at her, but she's most intelligent. Why does he always laugh at her? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think he disapproves of her. Hugo is quite old-fashioned in some ways. Please, Hilda. It doesn't really matter. Actually, she disapproves of him, too. <laughs> Sacrilege. <laughs> Oh, please, 
forgive me, you go really. That is very, very funny. Hilda, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Why do you ask? Have you been drinking? Oh, yes. We had a bottle of Van Rocher with dinner and two stingers afterwards. Hilda. You seem to have a positive genius for driving those you love to the bottle. Well, now that my wicked secret is out, I think I'm going to have another little drink. <laughs> it is as good to be hung for a sheep as a lamb. Hilda, I absolutely forbid you to drink any more brandy. I think you'd better go to bed. Entbehren, sollst du? Sollst entbehren. Das ist der ewige Gesang. Das ist von Goethe. Oh, he was a great genius. What does it mean? Deny yourself. You must deny yourself. That is the song that never ends. Ach, das ist besser. Das ist sehr gut. You are perfectly aware that I do not like you to speak German in my presence. It's a language I detest. The language of Goethe is not merely German, it is universal. And I would like to remind you, Hugo, that my translations of your books have earned you a great deal of money in Germany. I cannot feel that the subject of my foreign royalties can be of the smallest interest to Miss Gray. Wrong again, Hugo. Everything you have ever done or written is of absorbing interest to me. Now, is not that the most charming thing to say? Miss Gray has said so many charming things to me this evening. I'm quite confused. But why so suddenly formal, Hugo? You were calling her Carlotta when she first arrived. Well, I hope you will call me Carlotta, too. Oh, but of course, with the utmost pleasure. Oh, my God. Oh. Liesel was so amused tonight when I told her about this strange and unexpected reunion you were having with Carlotta after all these years. She must have a very warped sense of humor. What was it about the situation that so amused her? I don't know. Perhaps I was a little bit indiscreet, but, well, it was all such a long, long time ago, wasn't it? I mean, it couldn't really matter speaking of it now. Well, you are, you are not angry, I hope. Oh. Of course I'm not. You may not be, but I am. Why, has something bad happened? Oh, no, no. It's all been delightful. Carlotta came here this evening either to blackmail me or reform me. I've not yet discovered which. Blackmail? I do not understand. I do not understand at all what is happening. Well, if you'd spent less time guzzling down stingers with that leather-skinned old sapphist, your perceptions might be clearer. When you are ill and in discomfort, I am willing to endure your rudeness to me. But now you are no longer ill, you are perfectly well, and I will stand no more of it. And to show that there should be no further misunderstanding between us, I am, at this moment, going to have another brandy. This is certainly not your evening, Hugo. Now then. I should like to know what all this is about, this talk of blackmail. Uh, will you explain, Hugo, or shall I? No explanation is necessary. I do not wish Hilda to be involved in anything we've discussed tonight. It's none of her concern. Oh, on the contrary, I should say it concerned her most vitally. In addition to which, I do not consider her to be in a fit state to do anything but go to bed. What nonsense. My mind is perfectly clear. Perhaps a little clearer than it usually is. It's just only my legs that are a trifle uncertain. But I shall sit down. There. I am waiting. Well, Hugo? Carlotta is about to publish a book of her memoirs. She has asked permission to include in it some love letters I wrote to her in the 1920s. I refuse my permission. Oh, why? It sounds a most reasonable request to me. Are they nice letters? Charming. They make up in style what they lack in passionate intensity. A little later it transpired that she also has in her possession some other letters, written by me to someone else. These she threatens to hand over to an ex-Harvard professor named Justin Chandler, 
who is apparently planning to write an analytical survey of my life and works. He'll do it very well. He is a very clever man and a brilliant writer. What do you mean? Exactly what I say. You mean that you know him? No, not personally, but uh, we have corresponded quite a lot over the last three years. Well, don't look so agitated. I have said nothing indiscreet. He politely asked for certain information, and I, I saw no harm in giving it. What sort of information? Oh, dates of publication, and lists of places you have visited during your travels, a few small biographical notes. You know, he really is one of your greatest admirers. It will be an excellent book when he gets around to writing it. How dared you? How dared you? You have no earthly right to give out details of my private life to strangers without consulting me first. You have been guilty of the most shameful disloyalty. I have never been guilty of disloyalty to you, Hugo. Never in my whole life. And you will please never, never say such a thing to me again. And uh, these other letters, Carlotta, are they love letters? I think, I think I would rather not say. That means that they are. Very well, yes, they are. Who are they written to? I really cannot tell you that. Hugo, will you tell me? There would be nothing to be gained by my telling you. They were written many years ago, long before I married you. It is of no consequence. I think I can guess anyhow. But I would have liked it if you had told me yourself. They were none of your concern. They belonged to a part of my life that is over and done with. Over and done with? Oh, Hugo. Earlier this evening, you called me a dromedary, a camel, and an ass. But I should like to point out to you that all those three animals are more sensible than an ostrich. And pray, what do you mean by that? For over 20 years, I have looked after your affairs. You cannot seriously imagine that in all that time, you have been able to withhold many secrets from me. Those letters were written to Perry Sheldon, weren't they? Yes. Yes, they were. I thought so. As a matter of interest, I came across some of his replies years ago when we were packing up the house in Chapel Street. Where are they now? In your strong box in the bank. I put them in a sealed envelope and I wrote on the outside not to be opened till after my death and I signed it Hugo Latimer. And um, <clears throat> these letters from Hugo to Perry, Carlotta, you wish us to buy them from you? I have already explained to Hugo the letters are not for sale. You intend giving them to Mr. Justin Chandler? Possibly. I haven't quite made up my mind yet. Knowing Hugo's feelings in the matter, Miss Gray, that would be a malicious and unforgivable thing to do. I notice you no longer call me Carlotta. I called you Carlotta when I thought we were to be friends. But I cannot possibly be friends with anyone who sets out to hurt deliberately my husband. You don't find it humiliating to have been used by him for 20 years, not only as an unpaid secretary, manager and housekeeper, but as a social camouflage as well. Once and for all, Carlotta, I forbid you to talk like that. It's no use losing your temper, Hugo. We can neither of us prevent Miss Gray from saying whatever she likes. Has he ever once confided to you the secrets of his private heart? It was not necessary. I knew them already. That is an evasion, and you know it. You do. I think I can understand why you came here this evening. Your visit actually had uh, little or nothing to do with permission to publish letters or threats or blackmail, has it? No, no, it hasn't. 
Am I right in suspecting that you really came to resolve a problem of your own ego? To redress a small wrong that was done to it more than half a lifetime ago? In a way, you are right, yes. I thought so. But it isn't quite as simple as that. Nor, as a matter of fact, is it quite so self-centered. I genuinely wanted to prove to him that he has never taken into account the value of kindness or the importance of compassion. He has never had the courage or the humility to face the facts that it is not whom he has loved in his life that really mattered, but his own capacity for loving. Hark the Herald Angels saying. Stop behaving like that, Hugo. She should be ashamed. I see that in addition to being my unpaid secretary, manager and housekeeper, you have now elected to become my dear old nanny. Well, I see clearly that my mission has dismally failed. It could never have succeeded. You are a sentimentalist. Hugo is not. I, too, am a sentimentalist, but I am a German, and sentimentality is ingrained in the German character. Oh, there's a wide gulf between sentiment and sentimentality. Turgid mysticism, Santa Claus, Christmas trees and gas chambers. <laughs> you see, he is incapable of recognizing people as individuals. Why does he mean so much to you? Why are you so loyal to him? because he's all I have. When I came to Hugo as secretary, I was desolate and without hope. And when a little later he asked me to marry him, it seemed like a sudden miracle. Oh, please don't misunderstand me. I was never in love with him, and I knew that he could never be in love with me. I also knew why. And I was not deceived as to his reasons for asking me. I recognized his need for a facade, and I was willing to supply it. I am not pretending that our married life has been 20 years of undiluted happiness. He is often sarcastic and disagreeable to me, and I have frequently been unhappy and lonely. But then so has he. The conflict was in him between his natural instincts and the laws of society have for the most of his life been a perpetual problem that he has had to grapple with alone. And now, uh, to revert to the Perry Sheldon letters, um, you, of course, must dispose of them as you see fit, but... Uh, I cannot help feeling that a writer such as Mr. Justin Chandler would waste time in referring to them at all. If Perry Sheldon had been in any way significant as a human being, if he had in any way been worthy of attention on his own account, apart from the fact of his early relationship with Hugo, there might have been some point in disclosing them. But he wasn't. He was a creature of little merit. Foolish, conceited, dishonest, and self-indulgent. How do you know? Through Liesel. <laughs> Curiously enough, we were talking about him this evening. She knew him years ago when she was a scriptwriter in Hollywood. <laughs> she lent him money on several occasions. But as she said, there's no point in lending money to the morally defeated. They only spend it on further defeat. Here they are, Hugo. They can be of no practical use to me or to Mr. Justin Chandler, but they may conceivably be of service to you. Thank you. I cannot say that I entirely regret this evening. It has been most interesting and almost embarrassingly revealing. 
If anything I may have said has hurt you, I'm sorry. I don't apologize. I'm just sorry. I'm also sorry for having kept you up so late. I will see that the permission you asked for earlier in the evening is delivered to you in the morning. Good night, Carlotta. Good night, Hugo. Good night, Lady Latimer. Good night, Carlotta. I will see you out. Oh, no, there is no need. My room is just along the corridor. Nevertheless, I should like to. <laughs> 